So thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, the topic of our colloquium, Thinking Music in the Web Age, raises several questions. So the question, for instance, how much does music change the Web Age? And um, uh, how much does music change in the Web Age? And what is the driving force behind that change? And in my lecture, I will present a historical model what allows me to formulate, in respect to these questions, a first prognosis. And I suppose that one needs to look back very far in history to get the perspective right on the changes in the wet age today. Though the first step will be to introduce you to this historical model, and then I would like to draw an analogy between the cesuras in the human culture and the evolution in the music culture. And in my second step will be to exemplify this general thesis. And the thesis is that in the web age we see nothing less than the shift from a literate music culture toward a digital music culture. So the basic idea of this model is that the dominant medium of communication defines the type of society. So human language developed at least 100,000 years ago. And first we have tribal societies, which have been based exclusively on verbal communication. And oral communication limits the possible complexity of a society. All knowledge has to be kept in mind. There are metric practices, of course, in a tribal society, but one can only pass these practices in a verbal form that is in form of a narrative or by a teacher or by a shaman. And 10,000 years ago, the Neolithic revolution took place. So that was the development of agriculture and animal husbandry of sedentaries. And that led to the foundation of the first cities and city states. And um, this created a new complexity in the city and a new complexity of communication. And usually you need a bureaucracy on, in order to uh, organize this new type of complexity. And in this respect, 4000 and between 4000 BC and 2000 BC um, started to develop the, the first writing systems in the Near East. And writing is a new medium of communication. One can store knowledge on clay tablets and papyrus or paper. And what is important in, in comparison to the oral communication is that one can store more information, one can store this information for a longer time, and most importantly, one can store this information much more accurately than in a human brain. So, and that is a preposition for a much more complex society. The society is no longer organized in form of a tribe, but by stratification usually with the king on the top of the social pyramid. And this is um, in, in, in such a society, we have high culture with architecture, technology, science, geomet geometry, and philosophy. And what is in a in theoretical respect important is that is an emergence phenomenon. So the higher order communication um, um, is on top of the oral communication, so the writing communication sits on top of the oral communication and the higher order communication does not disappear but um, is um, overforming the lower oral communication. The, the next change in the structure of the society has been triggered by the printing press, by the invention of the printing press, this movable type around 1450 by Gutenberg. And once again, the printing press is an emergent phenomenon in relation to the handwriting system. So the printing process creates a new medium of communication and that will lead or lead to a totally different form of social organization of, so of society. Handwriting, in the handwriting culture, all knowledge is secret knowledge 
and books are very rare and very expensive and only few people can read and write but with the emergence of the printing press this is changing so the written word is available everywhere to everybody and more and more people can read and write and this written communication calls us once again a new kind of complexity in relation to to special questions namely scientific questions or legal questions or questions about art and religion or questions about economy and in reaction to this the so society develops special specialized communication systems so like an an juridical system and science system an art system an economical system and this um, communication system are closed um, uh, by um, in an autopoetical way and that means that we have a new type of society we have a functionalized differentiated society and that is the modern society in which we have lived until recently um, but today um, we have reached in a way the end of this kind of modern society uh, because the um, because of the computer-based communication and that is once again a new communication co communication medium uh, which is comparable with the invention of the printing press um, so the digital communication communication makes um, the access to information easier but most importantly and the most important aspect is that in the modern in the modern society most people were only able to receive information but in a digital society everybody can get out a message and bypass any kind of institution so everybody can turn his computer into a publishing house or into a radio station or into a television station and this creates a lot of network effects and these network effects destabilize uh, the society and they destabilize um, the democratic institutions and so now we in um, in a situation where we have to reinvent uh, liberal democracy in a digital age but luckily enough that's not our topic today um, in my music philosophy I used the general model which I uh, presented to you here in order to draw an analogy you can, fi you can find exactly the same caesuras in the Euro European music history as you could find in the general human history and let's see how this will work European music culture began as an oral music culture of Gregorian chants Gregorian chants are uncompanied plain chants in Latin, Latin language and they evolved into essential component of the Roman Catholic Mass. The oral medium of music has the same limitations as language. One has to remember the melodies by heart. These constrictions became at a certain point very problematic for the Catholic Church. On the one hand, the number of chants increased with the growth of ecclesiastical holidays and this likewise increased the required practice time in order to learn all these melodies by heart so ultimately one singer has to go through a 10-year musical apprenticeship before he knew the entire choral repertoire of the Catholic Mass and on the other hand the Catholic Church had a strong interest that every Christian could listen to the same plain change and the narrative behind that was that Pope Gregory I received these chants by the Holy Spirit in the 6th century. So um, the identical reproduction of Gregorian chants was, so to speak, an theological necessity. Um, but it became more and more difficult to fulfill this ideal in an oral medium of music. So when Gito Guido of Arezzo invented the four-line stuff system with a clef in 1026. He solved indeed a um, problem for the institution of the church. And the problem was 
passing a large number of Gregorian plane chains in a uniform, unchanging way over many generations and over large regional distances. This was the turning point from an oral music culture to a literal music culture. Guido's system was expanded in the next centuries so that it could incorporate rhythmic dimensions. This led to the formation of the so-called modal notation with six fixed predetermined rhythmical patterns. At the end of the 12th century, Perotin wrote the first four-part organa, such as Veterant Omnes, and this polyphonic music could not be created in the oral medium of music, but only on paper on parchment. And from this point forward, notation was a new medium of composition, out of which Western art music could develop. Over centuries, music was copied by hand. In the 18th century, the technology of music engraving was fully developed and the problem of the mechanical reproduction of complex music scores was solved. And this changed the music culture once again. In 1719, the first music publishing houses have been founded in Leipzig with the result that classical music opened up to the layman. The new emerging class of the bourgeoisie in the middle or the middle class developed a culture of music making in the home. One can speculate that classical music of Haydn, Mozart and Beethoven could only develop in such an environment in which the listeners did read and perform music by themselves. And in this line of thought music printing would be a precondition for the classical concert in which for the first time pure instrumental music was performed for its own sake. Um, today we live already in a digital music culture which is based on samples. Samples are sound waves stored in the format of digital information and uh, this creates a new medium of composition. One can copy, combine, transform and manipulate music samples on the computer. Sample composition are nothing new. So music concrete, for instance, is a sample composition. And what is really a game changer is the pos possibility to work with instrumental samples from acoustic instruments. So in 2000, the Vienna Symphonic Library was founded. That's a virtual orchestra which records every possible sound of any classical instrument and with this virtual orchestra you can record any kind of sheet music. Um, and the shift from a liter literal toward a digital music culture is a multi-dimensional phenomenon. So the digital revolution creates also a new medium of music distribution and music storage in comparison with the written music. Um, so in 2005 the video platform YouTube went online and in retrospect I would say that 2008 is a turning point from a literal into a digital music culture. Um, at this time for the first time the, um, the first um, digital conceptual music pieces have been uploaded by John Reinholdsen and Johannes Kreidler and the first um, sample compositions have been created in, at the time and sample compositions with, which has been done with pure instrumental samples. Um, I would define this uh, turning point. Um, um, the question is how do you define a turning point and I, s I would say you can define it if in respect to the most reluctant and difficult music scene and that is the music scene, scene which is um, um, uh, most strongly connected to the written music culture or the literal music culture and that is avant-garde music that's called or new music in Germany. Um, so uh, the question how does music culture change the web age, the question of our colloquium, that was initially the question of my book, The Digital Revolution of Music 
which has been published in 2012 in German and which is now translated into French. Uh, but my music philosophy in 2012 was a wager on the future. So I could develop this historical model and I could develop the argument which I presented to you now. Um, but um, and the argument was that the introduction of a new medium of communication has the power to change a social system and henceforward it has also the power to change the whole music culture. But um, theoretically I could anticipate the evolution um, of the music culture but there has been almost no striking examples and that is of course a disadvantage. In 2019, six years later, the situation has changed. And so I would like to present you in the second part of my talk four examples of art music which has been premiered after the book release. And these examples have uh, something in common. They are composed by the help of, instrument, uh, of instrumental samples that are pure sample compositions. Um, more precisely, I would call this, I call this compositions e-player composition. So if you remember, the virtual orchestra has been invented in order to record sheet music in a more economically and more efficient way. And in, 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 in this respect, so composing with instrumental samples, how you can find this now in the avant-garde music scene, is a kind of a creative misuse of the virtual orchestra. And uh, in a way, um, composing with, sam with instrumental samples creates a totally new phenomenon. And philosophers like to invent notions, new words, for new phenomenon, because then you can uh, bring this new phenomenon into language and to, into the social conscious. So in, in this way, I introduced the notion of the e-player in my music philosophy. E-player music is um, a hybrid between live music and recorded music. On the one hand, every, every sample which you can hear has been once played by a live musician, by a living musician. On the other hand, the human musician is absent during performance of such a sample composition. So that is the basic idea of the e-player. And here are my four examples. A very early example for an e-player composition is the Klavierübung from Stephen Takasuki, which has been uh, composed in between 2007 and 2009. So that's this turning point I talked about. Takasuki worked over a long time on a private sample collection and has recorded by himself all possible sounds of his piano. And his objective was to record samples with this very special aesthetic quality. Uh, and as you hear, they, ha they sound very dry. The, the whole piece is entirely composed by piano samples and other instrument, instrumental samples. Um, but this piece and this piece has some irony. There is some irony in the piece. The literal translation of the title of the piece, Klavierübung, is piano exercise. But actually, this piano exercise is unplayable for human performers. In other words, the piece is an exercise for failing. And for Takasuki, the unplayability of this music was rather a sign of its quality than a disadvantage because he envisioned this music as headphone music. So, five years later, the pianist Mark Knoop asked the composer for a live version of this unplayable, unplayable piano exercise. Takasuki extracted from his sample composition a piano voice which could be played together with the original piece. Um, so, so the, the, 
the E player piece is rendered by loudspeakers behind the piano and in front plays the pianist. In the result one can hear a musical competition between a live player and an E player. So <laughs> So this hybrid performance of an e-player and a live player is paradigmatic, I think, for a digital music culture in which editing samples is the primary medium of the composition. The original composition took place in the medium of samples and writing the score for the live performance became secondary. This is the point where the literate music culture turns into a digital music culture. Thomas Hunnell wrote the piece Sina, Kav Sina Ida Kavalienka for six instrumentalists and e-player orchestra in 2014. Hum Hummels, Thomas Hummels built uh, by himself a virtual orchestra, it's called Can Tambre, which includes also extended playing te techniques and that is very important for the avant-garde music because they use usually extended playing techniques. Um, uh, Thomas Hummel saw immediately the potential of this word e-player and he used it in his program and he used it for his composition. This wa that's why it called, it's called uh, e-player orchestra. Um, um, Sinaida Kavalenka is a good uh, example of the democrati democratization of art music by sample compositions. Uh, compos composers usually want to write for big orchestra, but in a literate music culture only few of them are so lucky to get commissions for this very expensive orchestral pieces. <laughs> My next example um, is uh, from an, a guitarist from Gunnar Geiser. Um, Gunnar Geiser published last year a CD with uh, the name Wannsee Recordings. Wannsee is a lake nearby Berlin, where the um, record where it was rec recorded. All the pieces you can hear on the CD are improvisations of an electric guitar. But Geiser in, invented a program so that he can trigger a collection of instrumental samples on his laptop by improvising. And just listen to the overture of the of the CD. <laughs> Here you can see Gunnar Geiser with his e-guitar and with his notebook during a live performance. Um, so it's an improvisation in the medium of samples, of instrumental samples, of, from acoustic instruments. What is striking, I think, is his new freedom for an instrumentalist. Um, so one musician cannot only play together with an orchestra, he can literally play the orchestra with his guitar. Um, 
And all these virtual instruments which you hear are played in real time, so there is no overdubbing in the performance. So my last example is a clip from Trent Reinholdson's opera, O Trilogy, which has been premiered last year at the Munich Biennale. In my opinion, this piece is the philosophically most ambitious and technologically most advanced opera which has been composed and performed in the last years. The entire opera is pre a pre-composed uh, sample composition which, usual, um, which uses all musical styles of classical music, new music, pop music, jazz and electronic music. You can hear now the so-called Hegel cantata which uses the most contentious sentence of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, uh, the sentence, the truth is the totality. Even the different voices of the cantata and of all other songs of that opera are created by the composer by himself by, by recording his own voice and then composing with these soundtracks. Uh, in this <coughs> clip, uh, then the Hegelian spirit is conducting th uh, three different strange figures with uh, a mask on the head. And I wrote an article about this, and I can't explain it to you now in detail, but I call them trolls. And trolls are mystical figures from, uh, from Norwegia. And, um, and Trond Reinelsen is a Norwegian composer. So. During the first part of the um, opera, the audience was, has been sitting like in a cinema performance and watched the pre-composed opera as a film performance and the Hegel cantata was part of this film performance. In the second part of the opera, the audience moved into another room and was sitting on the floor. Uh, this was a scene like an um, was in a way an initiation ritual um, uh, with different figures now um, and with live actors. Um, but the actors did not speak and sing but imitated by their body language the speech and the singing of the pre-composed tape. And once again, a short clip. <laughs> Let's have a short look at the table, uh, which you can find in my books, The Digital Revolution of Music. I make here the distinction only between an oral and literate and a digital music culture. The digital revolution embraces all dimensions of music production, music uh, distribution, and music reception. And you can find in all these dimensions 
emergent phenomena, as you can see here in the table. Uh, so in respect to these four examples, one can say the primary media of composition is no longer the medium of notation, but the medium of samples. So that's the first line. Or um, the primary modus of composition is not any longer writing music, but editing musical samples. So that is the third line. So notation doesn't disappear in a digital music culture, but it moves into a secondary state. So that's the end of my lecture. And so the shift from a literal toward a music, a digital music culture, started in my estimation 10 years ago. And it is important that um, this last step has been made by avant-garde music, by new music or art music. And fair enough, you could argue that it is way too early to make such a grand prognosis. But in the context of the historical model I presented to you, the thesis sounds, I hope the thesis sounds much more convincing as if I would only present you the most advanced examples of the digital music culture. Thank you very much.